Remember the old days, the pies your mother used to make? You'd go into the kitchen, there's mom breaking eggs, beating them. There'd be rich country cream and sugar and fresh fruit and real vanilla beans and butter. Remember all that? Well, you can forget it. Through the supermarket, we're bombarded with choices. Fresh or frozen? Low fat or lots of fat? Cool ranch or nacho cheese? With so much variety, we assume that some of it's healthy, some of it's junk, and at least we have a choice. But do we? Is picking the best from a pile of flavorless tomatoes really a choice? Or were key choices about what we eat made for us long before we walked into the store? The industrial food system is not doing what a food system needs to do, which is not just pr produce lots of food, but to keep a population healthy industrial food system is making us very sick in many, many different ways. There is the obesity epidemic, there is diabetes. Four out of ten leading killers in this country are, 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 are food-related chronic diseases. I'm really worried about what's going to happen in this country if we don't sort of wake up and understand the consequences of every decision that we make about everything that we eat every day. There's a big problem with food in our country today. Uh, large commodity producers and large agribusinesses have hijacked and taken over the farm subsidy programs and it's resulting in production of food types that aren't healthy for us Americans. Our government food policy promotes eating junk food. It really does. The rewards go to the people who make junk foods. So in a sense, our current food system promotes obesity. One of the most remarkable things, I think, about this rise of industrial food in the second half of the 20th century is that it's been underwritten by taxpayer dollars. If you listen to debates, there's never anything about the food system. It takes people like us, the sustainable food people, to bring up that stuff. And, uh, and when we go and we uh, get involved in, in, in the policy piece of the farm bill, it's like we're going up against Goliath. And we really lose almost every time. American food policy, starting really in the, 19, in the teens and in the 20s, was to supply, uh, supply people with the most amount of food at the lowest price. And that's not, that, I mean, that's not something to be sneered at. These days, when everybody has plenty, it's hard to remember when the South was the pellagra belt and when people really did not have enough food to eat. It's hard to believe it now, but there was a time when many Americans were starving. In the Great Depression, farmers were producing plenty of food, but no one could afford to buy it. So farmers started going out of business. Under the farm bill, Uncle Sam paid farmers not to grow so many crops. By keeping supply down, the bill kept prices steady for the farmers. But after World War II, things began to change. New farming chemicals led to bigger harvests, and new petroleum-fueled machines were created to keep up with the surge. Starvation was history. But the explosion of food into the marketplace overwhelmed the government's ability to manage supply and demand. In the 1970s, Secretary of Agriculture Earl Butts had a different idea. In a complete 180, the government abandoned small farmers in favor of large mega farms that could churn out as much food as possible. 
All we had to do was find someone to eat this avalanche of cheap, low-quality food. In just two generations, a nation racked by hunger ate its way into obesity, diabetes, and all sorts of other problems. And now the health of Americans is just, well, depressing. It's quite an accomplishment that we've managed to uh, make ourselves so fat so fast in this country. There are a lot of reasons for it, but, but one central reason is we got really good at producing huge quantities of cheap food. We thought we had to industrialize everything, including how to grow vegetables, farm tomatoes, or grow and raise cattle. And all of a sudden, we found out there's no taste. You taste it, everything tastes like nothing. We're designed to eat healthy, good, flavorful, delicious food. That's why we have taste buds. If we didn't, you know, if we were just supposed to eat paste, we wouldn't have taste buds, right? Studies are also showing that the intensity of aromas and flavors from properly grown vegetables are stronger, and it goes hand in hand with nutrition. There's more micronutrients, there's more macronutrients like vitamin A, there's more antioxidants. There's no question anymore that the nutritional quality of our food supply is declining with time. The food system has serious problems. It's not doing what we need it to do, and more and more people are recognizing that. To develop other ways of feeding ourselves, other whole systems for feeding ourselves, is very wise and the precautionary thing to do, given how the industrial food system is struggling right now. So, food in America is a sad story of unintended consequences. Government got us out of the frying pan and into the deep fryer. Now our grocery stores are packed with a bunch of junk. Luckily for us, there were a few passionate people who remembered what good, healthy food was supposed to taste like. But the battle lines for this food fight were drawn in an earlier conflict. Actually, it was kind of a big one. With the outbreak of World War II, food wasn't just food. It was national defense. Among those called to the armed forces, we discovered an appalling number of young men who were undernourished or improperly fed. And not of the standard of physical fitness essential to a hard-fighting army. 400,000 were rejected, many because of physical unfitness due to malnutrition. War and agriculture have all sorts of connections. They have since World War II. As the saying goes, an army marches on its stomach. So, the army spent tons of money figuring out how to get food to soldiers fighting overseas. They came up with some nifty ideas. Dehydration, flash freezing, and lightweight packaging. Portability was the top priority. Taste? Not so much. This necessity to get calories to soldiers to keep them fighting in the field turns into this ability to market processed food to average working people. Enter the K-ration, grandfather to the modern TV dinner. These war foods are also bulwarks against famine and catastrophe. To produce them, we have a new industry. This company intends to make K a packaged meal business when peace comes. Thanks to the war, we also learned how to make bigger and better bombs and it turned out the same chemistry could be used to make bigger and better fertilizers. You see, plants need nitrogen to grow, and we'd never found a good way to get it to them. But with the new artificial fertilizers, we could give plants all the nitrogen they could want. And big agriculture exploded. was one other giant industry feeding the agriculture boom. As it has in the past, America's oil industry will continue to supply power for the farmer to accomplish a job that's now worldwide in scope. The industrialization of food in America wouldn't have been possible without the big oil companies. And the petroleum industry quickly became one of the current system's biggest beneficiaries. The way we farm now, petroleum is in just about everything. And we're not just talking about fuel for the tractors. More and better insecticides, weed killers, fertilizers, better lubricants to protect machinery against the wear and tear of friction, and continually better fuels. New, bigger equipment guzzled even more gas, and soon farm productivity reached an all-time high. 
our farmers are producing about 6,000 calories per person per day. You should only be eating about 2,000 calories per person per day. So you have a situation of oversupply of food coming off of the farm. When you've got huge quantities of cheap food, the food industry will figure out how to make people eat them. Children often need between meal snacks for an adequate diet. Snacks like Hostess Twinkies. They help your child go and grow. Processed foods came in for a couple of reasons. One was there were all these commodities and you had to do something with them and this was a way to take cheap commodities and turn them into cheap foods. The other was changes in social patterns so that women went into the workforce and there was a tremendous demand for convenience. And so food companies said, ah, oh, you want convenience? We can do that. And off they went. Frozen food magic. Mrs. Henry, the magician. And here's your prepared dinner. In the 50s, Americans got a taste of the future. Suddenly, the kitchen was packed with newfangled gizmos that promised to make cooking as easy as pushing a button. Somewhere between science and marketing, everything seemed possible. It was a prepackaged, atomic powered space age. And we loved it. This industry rose up that was very, very good at. Um, at creating what would become convenience food. And it was presented to the, um, the housewife as it was like having a maid. Here is maid service. Maid service on a grand scale for America's millions of salad bowls. Meet some of the cooks you hire when you buy convenience foods. These women are checking fresh potatoes before making them into instant mash. The cooking was, of course, being done off, you know, like in factories away from you, but you could go and get some ready whipped cream. So instead of having your maid do it, it was done in a factory. Announcing a definite improvement on whipped cream. Cool whip non-dairy topping. A lot of the emphasis was on convenience, um, making things easy to prepare. And what got sacrificed in many cases was taste, flavor. Stop. You don't have to peel onions or mess with garlic. Taste Hap push button foods are here. Push button flavor was the greatest idea since sliced bread. So what if it tasted nothing like the real thing? We were told that cooking was drudgery. We didn't want to do that. We want to get fast food that's all prepared over there. But in fact, it's for me, it's so incredibly relaxing. It's like a you know, you're you're opening up all of your senses. You're your nose, your eyes, your ears, your hands, you're just in this food. In American culture in the, 20, in the second half of the 20th century, a lot of the things that we, a lot of the simple pleasures of life were, were getting sort of traded away for convenience. Americans didn't know what peas tasted like or corn tasted like or chicken tasted like or eggs tasted like because they'd had all these things that had sat around in a warehouse or been frozen and thawed and so on and so forth. Things came out of the freezer, they were in a convenient package, they were, they were coming in portions, and it looked like food, and it had many aspects of food, but it didn't really have very much flavor. Nothing had, had a singing taste. Nothing made you feel as if you were, you were part of the carrot, or the carrot was part of you. Today's parade of improved crops is sometimes taken for granted. Plant research has bred into them special qualities for fresh use, freezing, and canning. There's a great big difference between the green beans that we ate um, yesterday compared to the green beans that we ate in the 1900s. Fruits and vegetables are often completely processed, canned, labeled, and crated ready to ship within a few hours after they have been picked in the fields. The quality of our food is measured by how it'll ship rather than how it tastes. Food on the move, crisscrossing the country. In that traveling, they lose their taste. Um, the chemicals that are used on them result in a product that just doesn't taste as good as the old-fashioned one. The tomato is a prime example. It's been selected for storage and for keeping rather than for flavor and the qualities the consumer really wants in a tomato. They have to be picked green and, and packed and held in freezers and refrigerators and shipped long distances. And so they don't have that 
those quality sugars that only m come at maturity. And the nature of the sugars change as a fruit ripens. And, and it's those sugars that really are very important in bringing the quality of a fruit to us. Supermarkets need their thing to look r the same way uh, completely, have everything the same size, the same color. This one is like eating cotton. You know, it has no flavor at all. Why eat it and why pay your money? Why spend your hard-earned money on something which has no flavor? Uh, industrial agriculture had essentially ruined the quality of most American produce. This was the era of those three little pink tomatoes in the cellophane container in the little plastic box. I'd forgotten about tomatoes. I'd forgotten about when I was two years old, eating my way down a row of peas. I'd forgotten what food tasted like. I'd forgotten utterly. It was like I had a really bad cold during the 1950s. Taking a nation that thought Twinkies were good for you and reminding them what real food tasted like wasn't going to be easy. In fact, it would take a revolution. <laughs> Conformist 50s were overrun by the rebellious 60s, and a new counterculture was born. The epicenter of this cultural earthquake was Berkeley, California, where people were pissed off, loud, and hungry for change. I arrived in Berkeley, sort of front and center on the free speech movement that was going on this, uh, right at the time of the Vietnam War, and there were a lot of protests and kind of a feeling that we had to create our own culture, if you will, uh, sort of our counterculture. A very important part of the 60s counterculture was this idea that the personal is political and that you could not separate your politics from the conduct of your life and that uh, how you lived and how you ate was all of this was a political statement. The food movement did have its beginnings in the political movement. We wanted to change all the ways that we were doing things. People were starting farms, and growing their own food. There was this understanding that industrial agriculture was part of the military industrial complex. There were direct intersections in the, in the 60s between corporations that were profiting from the war in Vietnam and corporations that were profiting from the industrialization of farming and the poisoning of America's farm fields. The war machine was very much implicated in agriculture in America. Monsanto, the maker of Agent Orange, was the maker of the worst pesticides. Dow Chemical was a major producer of agrochemicals and also was a major producer of war chemicals, stuff like napalm, etc. The same company was actually poisoning our farm fields and poisoning peasants in Vietnam. There was this real sense that in fighting the Vietnam War, you were fighting a set of companies that were very implicated in that. I was definitely part of that kind of thinking, which led ultimately to my opening the restaurant. I think Alice thought, thought there was something missing from the, the revolution here in Berkeley, and that was uh, adequate attention to the sensual component, to the, the pleasures of everyday life, and specifically food. Most of the people in the free speech movement were classic 60s radicals. They didn't care what they wore. They didn't care what they looked like. They cared nothing for aesthetic values. They certainly didn't care what they ate. They ate chips and beer all night. It always offended me the way people were eating out of paper bags on the table and bottles of Coke and all the rest. And here we were talking about big corporations, and they're, they're buying from them. Alice began catering the revolution, essentially. She was feeding people who were holed up on campus, closing down buildings. She just began to develop the idea that maybe she'd like to have a restaurant, that maybe there could be a restaurant that would embody all these values that she had become so deeply committed to. Alice wanted to combine her love of food with her passion for politics. Little did she know, by opening Chez Panisse, Alice Waters would be firing the first shot in a culinary revolution. I wanted it to be a, a, a political place. I wanted it to be a place where people brainstormed ideas and, and diverse groups of people gathered in conversation with good food. She always believed that dining together around good food is progressive in itself and would lead to talking about the real problems in our personal lives as well as the, in the society we needed to change. The subversive aspect is to introduce people to new things that they like. 
not to beat them over the head with rhetoric. That has never converted anyone to anything. Chez Panisse leads with pleasure. It's about pleasure first. Everything else follows. The sort of revolutionary idea that that pleasure is important, that pleasure is under attack from the process of industrialization, ended up resonating a lot with people. The restaurant was this great experiment, and it pulled in people, it educated them. It was a continual astonishment and a source of enormous pleasure. Chez Panisse was a place for people to come and share their views and, and share their lives and become part of something bigger than just a restaurant. Chez Panisse was a popular place to enjoy a great meal and some enlightened conversation, but it wasn't about to change the world. At least not yet. It was still missing one crucial ingredient, an out-of-work architect whose hobby happened to be gourmet cooking. I think what really turned the corner for Chez Panisse in, in, in a lot of ways, and, and for, sub, for Northern California, was when Jeremiah Tower showed up to work there. Jeremiah Tower came to the restaurant early on, and I was a very insecure cook, and he was a very... Uh, strong uh, sense of, uh, I think that's the, how to say this, diplomatically. Imperiousness. Great confidence. Trying to be a little diplomatic but not be too diplomatic. Energy. Condescension. I was very insecure in my cooking and he wasn't. He was very... Uh, uh, Pretentious. Elegant. Swashbuckling. Okay. He just had these beautiful ideas and was ready to accomplish them in, in all the detail. Jeremiah w came in with that sense of, there's no other way to put it, flamboyance. You know, of, of this is going to be spectacular. You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe what we're going to do here. He came with this immense fund of knowledge of classical French cooking. Somehow my brain was wired so that I could read a 200-year-old recipe and taste the food. So that helped me later on. I knew what the flavors had to be, and once you know that, you can actually find your way there. Alice was kind of, you know, hippie wearing Mary Jane shoes and funky old dresses from the 20s, but she fell in love with this big, blonde, glamorous, totally self-confident character. Jeremiah was a marvelous cook and he completely transformed the restaurant. Jeremiah produced these spectacular multi-course meals with different sauces and unheard of ingredients and recipes that literally had never been seen before in the United States. This was at a time, of course, when chefs weren't glamorous. They were just workmen, technicians. He was an artiste. Jeremiah and Alice were fearless in their culinary risk-taking. They created menus that celebrated their love of both food and culture. Themed menus with a literary twist. A tribute to Alice B. Toklas, for example, or a Gertrude Stein dinner. Who knows what goes into a four-course evening of Salvador Dali, but no doubt, dessert was surreal. Most of the time it was excellent. Every now and then it was inedible. Um, there was an, an episode with eel that, that did not work at all. In 1976, Jeremiah's experimentation culminated in a groundbreaking meal he called the California Regional Dinner. The politically aware diners of Berkeley ate it up. They were amazed to learn that exotic ingredients didn't have to come all the way from Europe. They could be found right in their own backyards. That dinner was quite famous. I impressed myself with that, I must say. We gathered all of the ingredients from, from Northern California nearby and sort of named them. Tamales Bay oysters and uh, garapata trout from Big Sur. Everything was local and it was remarkably prescient. That became really important to the whole philosophy of the restaurant, that we identified where those foodstuffs came from. This meal, paired with the revolutionary spirit of Chez Panisse, launched local food onto the national stage. It was the dawn of a new era. It was delicious. After the regional dinner, everyone went, wow, we are in a wonderful region called California. Why don't we just relax and be Californians and cook, be Americans? Maybe American food can be great again. 
Jeremiah Tower's breakthrough had been a victory for delicious local food everywhere. Meanwhile, across the country in Washington, D.C., plans were being cooked up to industrialize food on a massive scale. The budding local food movement was in danger of being inadvertently stomped out by, of all things, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I announced the nomination of the new Secretary of Agriculture and Armistice Day. <laughs> He's been wondering what became of the truce. <laughs> I, Earl Lauer Bucks, I, Earl Lauer Bucks, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear. Before Earl Butts, the goal of federal food policy was careful management of supply and demand. This was about to change. We're going to make this industry pay. And the way you make it economically attractive is to regain respectability for a very simple six-letter word. It's spelled P-R-O-F-I-T. Earl Butts was a very mercurial character. He was a very um, flamboyant character. He shot straight from the hip. I've got a name that lends itself to puns, and I'm the first one to pun on it. Uh, some of my friends at Purdue University sent me that sign the other day. He was a professor at Purdue and executive with Ralston Perina. And when he became secretary of the Department of Agriculture, he very much bought into this idea of farming as a way to create cheap food. For 40 years, my philosophy has been on the side of the private sector. He started the process of peeling back and dismantling these New Deal mechanisms and basically telling farmers to plant fence row to fence row, don't leave any land fallow, grow as much food as you possibly can, and if you're not big, get big or get out. Earl Butts set out to apply his big business mindset to agriculture. His pitch to farmers was this. Grow as much food as you can. We'll do our best to help you sell it. Anything you can't sell to Americans, we'll slough off on the Russians. Ah, don't you worry about your pocketbook. If prices fall, we've got your back. Instead of supporting farmers for not growing food, farmers were encouraged to grow more food, and they did so with enormous efficiency. It sounds like a great idea. Capitalism at work, everybody wins, right? The real beneficiary of the subsidy system is not farmers because they were struggling in this industry where they are the low cost producer. The real beneficiary were the buyers of the grain, the buyers of the corn and the wheat and the soy that could buy the product at a very cheap price and then process it into something and sell it at a higher price. We're talking about companies like Archer Daniels Midland, we're talking about Cargill, which processed the corn and soy into all these products that end up on the supermarket shelf. Cheese? No, not real cheese. A delicious imitation of cheese. It has less than 20% of the milk fat of cheese. The rest has been replaced by golden corn oil. What the Farm Bill does is to subsidize commodity ingredients. Commodity ingredients get turned into very highly pro profitable processed foods. High fructose corn sweeteners to replace imported sugar in soft drinks and countless other foods. Nutritionally complete food blends for feeding hungry people throughout the world. Corn gets turned into corn sweeteners. Soybeans get turned into soy oil, which turn up in a lot of cheap food products. And these food products are cheaper on a per calorie basis than are fruits and vegetables, which are considered by the Department of Agriculture to be specialty crops and not worthy of the kind of attention that corn, soybeans, cotton, and wheat get. So in a sense, our current food system promotes obesity. Pioneering new foods to meet today's and tomorrow's nutritional challenges. That is how ADM uses America's abundance to meet the world's needs. The whole process ends up being shot through with cheap corn. It's the oil that they fried the McNugget in. It's the feed that fed the chicken. It's, it's the breading on the McNugget. And so, you, you know, basically nutrition ends up narrowing down to this seemingly endless variety of products that are really basically iterations of cheap corn and soy. 
government subsidies go to pay for exactly the ingredients that end up in the profitable junk foods that end up adding calories to people's diets that they don't really need, when what you really want people to be eating is fruits, vegetables, whole grains, meat and dairy products, and all those foods that are on the periphery of the supermarket. Next time you hit the supermarket, you can check it out for yourself. Around the periphery is the good stuff, produce, meats, dairy, but to get to any of it, we have to walk through rows and rows of processed junk. That isn't a coincidence. There's a definite link between the policies that Earl Butts promoted, which meant greater farm consolidation, the integration of agriculture, and the type of food production system that we have today. It's led to a, a farm subsidy program going to the largest commodity producers at the expense of everyone else and uh, a food system that isn't healthy for us Americans. And this entire system is based on producing a, a whole ton of food that's making us sick. If you look at the cost of food as a percentage of income over time in the United States, in the past 30 years, you get a steadily downward graph. And that is sort of the triumph of industrial food, and that's the triumph of Earl Butts. He can point to that chart and say, look, what I did worked. But if you take the same chart and you look at the per capita expenditures on healthcare over time over the same period, it's going in the opposite direction. And so what we're doing as a society is we're spending money that we used to spend on good quality healthy food and we're spending it on healthcare, on treating the consequences of this cheap food system that we've created. So Earl Butts' triumph ends up being extremely expensive costly, damaging, hurtful of human beings. This is common old-fashioned genetics. That's what we always use. This is Danvers 126 carrot, which has been around for a hundred years, a standard old standard old carrot, very fine grain, very firm. Is that carrot organic or is it just happy to see me? Bob Kennard has been growing incredible crops for years, but in 1975, a farmer like him had no way to distribute them. I started in farming at a peak of, of the in industrialized, ship it in from every place, don't grow it locally, um, a kind of agricultural foundation and the only thing locally was grown was the local family garden, and I wanted to grow a big local family garden so I could feed many of my neighbors. And yet there wasn't a means to be able to do this. In a market flooded with commodity crops, would anyone still care about a few good vegetables? When I opened the restaurant, I wasn't looking for the organic local farmer or rancher. I was simply looking for taste. And in the process of looking for taste, I found those people. What Chekhanese stands for today, the seasonality, the simplicity, the total focus on ingredients, the focus on pure food without pesticides, herbicides, or other pollutants anywhere, or moral pollutants for that matter, in its history, that was all to come from Alice. She just simply said, I'm not going to settle for ingredients that don't taste good. Who would ever have guessed that the taste of vegetables would turn out to be the start of a revolution? She wasn't a, um, a missionary for organic agriculture. She was a missionary for really high quality produce. And as it turns out, the way you get high quality produce is growing it organically. What gives taste is the soil. This is the part that everyone's been forgetting about. Oh, it's a wonderful smell. As a matter of fact, would you like to smell something? When you pick up a handful of soil in an organic farm, you're picking up essentially a living organism. There's all sorts of microorganisms and bacteria that not only fix nitrogen to the soil, but efficiently transmit that nitrogen into plants and other, other micronutrients that get leached out in industrial agriculture. Biology and minerals in a symbiosis create taste because they're really what are making the flavors. They're making the acids, they're making uh, the esters, they're, they're making all this stuff. We have no idea how to do that as precisely as this earth can do it without a thought. A plant that's well-grown um, 
has its complete nutritional integrity. So it gets to form and function its com all of its metabolic systems. And as it becomes physically complete and de internally devoid of hunger, you get refinement in textures and aromas and geometries and, um, and flavors. What's important here is not how the fertilizers don't do things, but how the biology really does. So when the biology is gone, all you're left with is this sort of soluble liquid that can, it's like an IV for the plant. Once your life is done, you're stuck on an IV for the last remaining potential till you can be cut down and eat. <laughs> it's the vegetable world. <laughs> it's not a little quick grown, pale yellow, um, a uniform selected thing. It's, uh, I don't know what kind of resolution you can get on that if you can see light through that guy but you'll see the solidness if you look at it in a 10 power magnification even you'd see the solidness and the fine grainness of it and each cell is filled with its protoplasm that's the goal yeah. to build chai panisse alice had to build a whole food chain and i don't think she meant to do that i don't think that was her idea she wanted to serve really good food, but she couldn't find that produce. 85% of cooking is finding the ingredients. In the early days of Chez Panisse, they would canvas the Berkeley neighborhoods looking for fruit, looking for lettuces, doing all of these different kinds of things. The chefs at Chez Panisse suddenly had lightning in a bottle. By serving up food that came straight from the local farmer, they gave their customers what they wanted to eat instead of what the government wanted to sell. This is kind of the philosophy of the restaurant, to buy food that's in season. Two carrots, three fennels, three leeks, three chervil. Serve it simply. Six endive, three escarole, two radicchio. And also to buy food that's locally available. Savory, sorrel, thyme, um, and I'll add manzanita wood to that. Inspired to obtain only the freshest ingredients, Chez Panisse rejected the entire concept of industrialized food. It might have started with the search for some fresh radicchio, but soon everything the restaurant served was local. They hadn't just improved the menu, they'd set a whole new food economy in motion. We built a network of suppliers that were directly connected to the restaurant. So we gave them the money and they brought us the produce and the meat. And this created a, an economy that was outside of the middleman and the normal distribution system. Farmers markets came into the mix in the late 70s. The, the enabling legislation in California was in 1977. All of a sudden, a farmer who grew something that was different or grew something that had great flavor could get paid more money for it instead of having to have a 400 acre farm to be able to make a, a middle class income, if you could grow the right things on 30 acres, you could make almost as much money. And I think that there was a real symbiotic relationship there between the chefs who were looking for these, the most perfect, most pristine, most flavorful ingredients, and these small growers who were saying, you know, I never wanted to be selling to Safeway in the first place, so now here's some place where I can actually sell things, I can make enough money to keep my farm going, and do things I feel good about. The farmer's market was a wonderful venue, and all oh, us little farmers got to sell stuff direct to the customer, and, and coming to those farmer's markets came restaurateurs that, oh, they have diversity, we have choice, we have something different than the restaurant down the street has, they became inspired, and they inspired us, the restaurants back and forth. The fact that, that chefs come to the farmer's markets and they kind of create a scene around the farmer's market, and then they market that pr product in the, on their menus where they'll identify a farmer, that makes a huge difference. By highlighting their ingredients and naming where they came from on their menus, high-profile chefs refocused the spotlight on local farmers and the public followed in droves. Why not shop where the chefs shop? With the movement in full force, Americans realized when it came to buying food, we finally had a choice. During that five-year period of time, 
farmers markets proliferated all around the Bay Area and down into Santa Cruz where most of these counterculture people arose that wanted to grow and provide foods for the local marketplace. This was a movement that was already gathering steam. And the more farmers markets there were, the better the farmers did, the more people went into small-scale organic farming. And so the choices multiplied and the integrity of the operations increased as well. Now there were farmers springing up all over the place and raising food that was just better and better and better. Farmers markets allow farmers to recapture more of the food dollar. It basically gets them out of the commodity market of selling an undifferentiated commodity that's going into a huge pile with everybody else's potatoes or everybody else's milk and uh, suddenly they're connecting directly with the end user, which is to say the eater, um, and not the whole commodity system. And uh, that's an enormous boon to them, uh, not to mention to, to us eaters. For more than 25 years now, American chefs have been seeking out the best ingredients and finding them locally. But you don't have to run a world-class restaurant to get your hands on the good stuff. We are at the Wednesday Santa Monica Farmers Market here in beautiful Santa Monica, where we come we come here every week uh, to shop for the re both restaurants. This is the big market. That's why we all do what we do. Yeah, look for what's growing now, what's beautiful, a special surprise, and then also to talk to the farmers and find out what's coming up next, and um, just to kind of get invigorated and excited about what we do. The market went away and someone told me like, okay, well you just call this number and order whatever you want. I, I literally don't know what I would do. I mean, I would maybe have to go do something else. There's a lot of good reasons to buy locally and to, to work within the local framework. Environmentally, it's a better thing. The food tastes better. It's better for us. It's not pumped full of chemicals. It's not picked early and gassed to become ripe when they want it to become ripe. It's not been sitting on a supermarket shelf. For me, at the restaurant, I think the choices that we make every day are choices for the small independent guy, the local farmer over the big grower, the agribusiness. Mmm, political activism never tasted so good. cuisine has sort of moved moved east. And definitely when I eat out in New York, I feel it much more now than I did five years ago or ten years ago. It's a regional, market-driven, you know, seasonal approach to cooking, and I think people there are much more interested in farmers markets and finding heirloom products, local products. The heart of it has moved 
has spread and become, it's become its own thing. I always try and shop at a farmer's market because I like to cook. I like the fact that the food changes throughout the year. If I want one beautiful bell pepper, I can buy one. I don't have to buy a package or, you know, I think it's, yeah, I guess, say like, good morning. <laughs> I can t definitely tell when I am eating healthy and eating this sort of produce. Well, I, I really want to buy everything that's local. I don't want to use any unnecessary fossil fuels if I don't have to, and it also tastes better. Often we bring our dogs. It's a lot of fun. So the food's definitely healthier for my daughter, and I like it myself. It tastes better. Um, I'm big on the eggplant right now. I don't know why. Sometimes we even take little things and plant them at home, too. It's just one other uh, part of New York, honey. Why don't you? Why do you speak shop? To um, I shop here because everything is fresh, you know, straight from the garden. It's real, natural. The Northeast has some terrific food. I just was at the farmer's market this morning and brought some great organic strawberries, um, TriStar strawberries. Yeah, where are the strawberries? They're uh, You sold them all, and I don't yeah. have any for today. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Call them. Who is that? John George. Hey, John George. Hollywood. Can you get Holly? Can you come here one second? I just want to grab them one strawberry. Hold on. TriStar is a real s small, fragile. Uh, it's a non-commercial variety. This berry found a home in New York City with the French chefs and the, uh, the little old ladies that come up to me and they'll be like, "This is how a strawberry is supposed to taste." I just right. love when they tell me that, you know. You can support local agriculture and your immediate locale, locality, even in the middle of the winter. It takes a little more planning, it takes a tiny bit more sacrifice, but not a lot. I think this whole thing is spreading all over the country. We were just in Vermont, we were shopping, we went to all the local markets in Vermont. I'm from the Midwest originally, and I live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I'm from Kansas City, and we go every Saturday morning to our local farmer's market. It seems that each week almost there's more farmers here and more people, for one thing. I mean, it, it, I think people are really starting to pick up on the fact that it's important to pay attention to where your food comes from and what's in, what's in it. 25 years ago, it was this tiny little snowball. Today is like a big steamrolling avalanche moving forward. It's not stopping, it's continuing to move and bigger and better. Farmers markets are starting to take root across the country. But it's not so easy for some people to reach them. Wolfgang Pock might be up to his ears in Arugula, but what if you live in a low-income area of an inner city? Or in a region that's buried in snow half the year? Some people can't even track down a dull banana, let alone a local farmer. Thankfully, a handful of political activists are stepping up to fill in the gaps. My name is Will Allen. I'm a farmer. Uh, I'm also the director of Growing Power here in Milwaukee, which is a not-for-profit not organization that does work uh, worldwide. Uh, around the agricultural system. What's my favorite food? Uh, I don't want to say goat. But, you know. <laughs> Growing Power exists to try to make sure that healthy, safe, affordable food um, is available for all people regardless of their economic status. Food means uh, a lot of things to me. Of course, uh, you know, looking at my size, you can tell that I've always ate very well. Uh, growing up on a farm, uh, food is meant uh, uh, to me being able to uh, eat in a sustainable way. Of course, back then we weren't talking about sustainability or organic or whatever, but we always grew food without chemicals using natural means. The reason that big uh, ag doesn't grow delicious food, that's not really their aim. Their aim is to make dollars. You know, to grow delicious food, you got to grow soil. This comes from compost. Uh, this also comes from the food waste, from the corporate food system that comes from California. And it's stuff that they didn't sell, pallets of apples and tomatoes and that sort of thing. He says let me, let me, nothing because... Let, let me, just hold on, I'm gonna show you something. I know Jim, I've known him for 30 years. Hey Jim, nice looking greens. It's Will. Uh, this will. Hey, listen, we want to get your waste. I, I understand we didn't pick it up a couple of times. We'll start rolling Monday. 
That's how it's done. It's done. It's done. It's done. It's done. In the wintertime, you can grow a variety of different uh, cool weather crop things like beet greens, uh, corn mosh, mizuna. And we uh, grow things uh, specifically for chefs. If a chef calls me and says, can you grow this particular green, I'll grow it for him. I think we've missed a couple generations from where uh, we've got totally disconnected from uh, passing on the art of growing, even growing food in the backyard. One of the things that I, uh, I decided to do was to open up the facility to the community. It was an opportunity for me to introduce them to what really, what does a tomato really taste like? And what does a cucumber taste like? And what does basil taste like or salad mix? I eat these in salad. There you go. Or on a sandwich. Oh, yeah. I believe that the local seasonal kind of, you know, 100 mile diet, all that kind of stuff is very elite. Yeah, yeah, it's a little elitist. We have kids that have never tasted you know, a fresh tomato. And that's who we're trying to work with. We're not trying to get them to only eat something within a certain amount of miles. People like Will Allen and his daughter Erica are doing what the government isn't, making sure everybody has a choice. You don't have any bananas, do you? Yes, we do, sir. Right behind you. Yep. Well, they're supposed to be right where I can get <laughs> Everyone deserves to have their basic human rights covered, and. One of them is food, and people don't have equal access to food. Community food security is currently a missing civil right. If you go to cer certain areas of, say, Chicago, or even Milwaukee, you won't find grocery stores. So people have to eat at corner stores. They can't eat food like we have here. If people don't have good nourishing food, they can't be productive, they can't be healthy. I mean, those things are all mitigating factors and ability for community to thrive, and we don't have that. My dad would always say to me, someday you'll thank me because you'll know how to grow food and there'll be other people who don't know how to grow food. And it's, you know, it's pretty prophetic because that is, that is the state of affairs that we have generations now that not only don't know how to grow food, they don't even know what all the food tastes like. They don't know how to prepare it. Some of those basic things that you need as a human being to sustain yourself. This garden is the Cabrini Green Community Garden Partnership. I think most people in America know about Cabrini Green. It's one of the first housing developments that um, was put in. Many generations now have grown up in what was um, once designed just to be temporary housing. It's predominantly African American, very, very low income, they're very disenfranchised. This garden is approximately a quarter of an acre of surface growing space, but it's probably like more of an acre because of the compression of how we grow produce. I would say we could probably easily feed 200 people a week. And this garden, I think, exemplifies how food production can be beautiful, can be educational, and can also be very profitable. People have to take control of their food system. People have to grow in their backyard. Get rid of the lawn. Really, this is about you know addressing power and privilege and doing so through food. What we're doing is civil rights part two. It's part of Dr. Martin Luther King's dream of beloved communities, and part of that is having fresh, safe, healthy food. So we're, we're doing it. Good food should be a right and not a privilege. And I think people see it as something only for the people who can afford it. But really what we need to do is bring this good food into the public school system and make it available for every child who lives in this country. Right now, we're feeding them food that isn't good for them. School lunch is making our kids sick. The CDC has said that of the children born in the year 2000, one out of every three Caucasians and one out of every two African Americans and Hispanics will have diabetes in their lifetime, and further, most before they graduate high school. The result's going to be these same kids born in the year 2000 are going to be the first generation in our country's history to die at a younger age than their parents. So food is making our kids sick, and school has to take the lead. Schools absolutely have to take the lead to turn this around. I 
I started the Edible Schoolyard because I was worried about the future of our kids. The goal of the Edible Schoolyard program is to get students to learn about where their food comes from and learn about sharing food as a community. Let's pick out one more. At the beginning of the year, it's always important to bring the sixth graders into the garden through food and through taste and through seducing them into the project. And one of the ways that we've done that is over the years we've developed a sort of tradition of every sixth grader harvesting, um, grilling and eating a fresh ear of corn out of the garden. So that's what they're doing today. The last couple of years we've added a sort of taste comparison with corn that we've grown in the garden and corn that we've purchased at Monterey Market down the street. You're going to each taste half of the ear of corn from the garden and then half is from the market. And we're going to do a little bit of comparing of the two. The one from the garden. <laughs> and this one tastes better. This is the one that we grew. The other one from the market. It's like tasteless. This is nasty. It's unanimous that the garden corn is, is better. Good. Delicious, all right. The Edible Schoolyard is important because we're teaching kids to think critically about the food choices yeah. that they're making. That when you decide what kind of food you're going to buy, you're affecting your health, but you're also affecting the environment and the community that you live in. That these choices are more than just outside, you know, what you're doing for yourself. Sort of like toothpaste a little bit. Fine. Like how toothpaste? Berkeley, we are trying to totally change the paradigm. So we have the delicious, nutritious food in the cafeterias. We are coordinating that with our hands-on experiential learning and cooking and gardening classes, and as well, academic curriculum. So we're really trying to change children's relationship to food to save our kids and probably the planet as well. We need to bring this delicious food into the public school system and feed it to every single child, every single day, from kindergarten all the way through high school. The goal is to make edible schoolyards around the country in programs, um, school programs nationwide. What we need is to get politicians to say, these are important, we need to fund this, we need to give money towards educating kids about where our food comes from. A lot of people have gotten together to figure out how to create a program that can really feed our children. But this isn't a program that can be funded in this way, because we're talking about rebuilding kitchens, we're talking about hiring of teachers, we're talking about paying farmers the real price of food. And we either pay up front for this or we pay out back. This needs to be funded by the federal government, by the state government. Nobody is standing up for our children, and that's what we as citizens in our country of a democracy have to do. I'm Representative Ron Kind. Uh, I represent the 3rd Congressional District of Western Wisconsin. I ran for Congress because I hope to make a difference in people's lives. And I decided to take a leadership role with the Farm Bill because of the implications it has for all of us throughout the country. For too long, farm policy has resulted in billions of dollars of subsidies going to a few but very large and very wealthy entities who then gobble up family farms around them, drive up land values, and make it virtually impossible for new beginning farmers to enter the business. Today, 70% of the agriculture subsidies are going to the largest and wealthiest 10% of the producers. And yet those who are producing specialty crops, for instance, the fruit and vegetables, the things we need to be consuming more of in order to battle the obesity epidemic, childhood obesity, they get nothing in the way of subsidies at all. And yet they're the majority of agriculture production here in the United States. Hey, you know, the Kind Flake Amendment was really a statement about the future of food policy and where we're going to go with this farm bill. Clearly, if we did the Farm Bill right this year, 
It could be the healthy food bill of the 21st century. What we propose in our amendment would be significant new investments in other priority areas. We have a, a $1.2 billion increase for specialty crops and a healthy food program to combat the obesity epidemic which is ravaging our nation. We also had provisions in there that encouraged local production, that allowed a, uh, a transition program for farmers to get into organic production, the establishment of farmer markets and food to cafeteria programs for our schools. This is what happens when people aren't on the Agriculture Committee and get involved in this very complex area. I'm uh, Congressman Colin Peterson. I'm chairman of the House Agriculture Committee. The goal of the Farm Bill is to make sure that we have the uh, most efficient, uh, low-cost um, produ production agriculture uh, that we can have. I've heard that the goal is to maintain a, a, a low-cost food system for the American consumer. But I think the typical consumer realizes that our farmers need to make a, different, uh, a decent living, too. There's a lot of forces out there trying to get us to change what we're doing, and we are changing. But you can't just pull the rug on or, out from under what we've been doing for the last hundred years. The argument's always, well, wait five years from now. You know, this is too much too soon. And I've been here for a while. I've been through a couple of farm bill debates. Those five years never do arrive at your doorstep. But you also have some very powerful and entrenched special interests whose job it is to protect the status quo. The farm state politicians that have taken over the major Senate and House committees, they're on the payroll of the large farming interests in their states. And so you get this, this situation where we have now where there's a lot of public outcry about the Farm Bill and people are hungry for reform, they're hungry for information about how the Farm Bill works. Um, but at the same time, these voices are completely marginalized in Washington. When you go up, up against the, the very powerful lobby, but also agriculture committees that are the true beneficiaries uh, of these farm subsidies, it's very difficult then to uh, convince enough colleagues that, that reform can happen today rather than waiting five years from now. Madam Speaker, I rise today in opposition to the kind amendment and in opposition to any amendment trying to destroy the Farm Bill. I just want people to know what this bill actually does, and um, it does not do what uh, some people have been saying. I rise in, in opposition to my good friend from Wisconsin's piece of legislation. It's well-meaning, but I believe it does not address the needs of, of my district. What do we want for our future? Vast corporate-style egg production or family farmers? Now, the kind amendment may be kind to someone, but it's not to American farm families. I thank the gentleman from Minnesota. I can't say enough good things about the wonderful work he's done as chairman of this committee. Madam Chair, the fundamental fact is that when you've got two-thirds of the subsidy program in this Farm Bill going to just 30 congressional districts who are well represented on the committee, I think it's unrealistic to expect that that committee is going to produce a policy statement that embraces reform and new ideas. I should know. I used to serve on the committee. My district takes a hit under this uh, reform bill, but sometimes it takes Gentlemen, a group of well-intentioned individuals to move the cause of reform forward, and that's what we're trying to do tonight. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. I took up the cause and the fight for this farm bill because I think it's important. This is about support for family farms and giving them a fair shake. But it's also a fight over the course of future agriculture. How are we going to manage the lands? What type of food uh, products are we going to produce? It's a fight worth having uh, because there's a lot at stake in, in writing on the outcome of it. But it's a fight that can't be waged alone. It can only be won through the help and the interest of the country as a whole and the American people. A lot of checks and balances built into the system, but it doesn't mean you can't come to work prepared every day and you can't fight hard for the principles and the values that you believe in. I think the future of reform in the Farm Bill has never been stronger, and as more people get more informed, I think this is going to become a more powerful political message to convince my colleagues in Congress that this is the right thing to do.
It's striking how, of all those different 60s strands, sexual liberation, environmentalism, civil rights, that food is one of the more vital ones today. I don't think the others have gone away. I think they've been folded into everyday life. And you could argue food was just a little later to achieve that kind of prominence. The locally grown food movement is about several things. It's about getting better food and fresher food and not having thousands of miles of transportation involved. But it's also about community. It's also about the kind of community that you want to live in. I like the idea of knowing the people who are growing my food, and I love the idea that I can go and visit the farm and see it myself. I think it's beyond just telling people to eat organic. Now it's about Who's growing your food? You know, are they part of your community? Are they invested in the health of the community? And how can we get communities to own their food system? It's a way to help transform society. Social activism does not need to be going out in the middle of the street and banging on a drum. Social activism can be making a good meal. Organic agriculture was built with absolutely no help from the government, no help from any institutions. It was really consumers and farmers working together, you know, making that bridge uh, themselves. What we've come to now is a recognition of responsibility. Uh, that's a delicious future. Good food touches everyone. It's our common language. Everyone eats on this planet. And if we all ate uh, with pleasure and intention, we could really change the world. You can make a difference in this world about food by being more demanding. You go to your local supermarket, you go to your local restaurant, and don't be worried, demand the best. Contact your representative's offices in both the House and the Senate. Tell a friend. Build your backyard into uh, a seasonal garden. And keep away from big businesses and out of chain grocery stores. You can support your local farmers and uh, by coming here regularly. It's the easiest thing and it will be the best thing for you. That's it, that's all you really need to do. We have power here, and we don't have to go anywhere. We just have to like vote with our forks. We get three votes a day. They don't all have to be perfect, but if one of them, if one of them a day is done in consciousness with an eye toward the land, the farmer, the animal, we will have done something important. We do have choices, not just about what we're going to have for dinner tonight, but how our country feeds itself. So what are you waiting for? Help yourself. All right, so give us one really good piece of dirt from your... I mean, can you do something in like 30 seconds? Give me some dirt. A piece of dirt in 30 seconds? In the book. Oh, shoot. Give, me, give it to me in 10 seconds. I got to go. <laughs> Quick. Like the time Craig Tavern put his hand down the back of my pants. Whoa, whoa. Well, that there you have it. Enough. There you have it. Oh, That's oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Say that? Nah. <laughs> I always end up saying controversial stuff. The best one I heard was someone call me the friendly Fuhrer. <laughs> well, that's the way it works. I mean, you just, you know, just uh, a chef is a little bit of a slave driver. We're cheaper than if you eat at the West Beach. Stop it, you know. It's not funny anymore. Yeah, I feel that in my tenure there, I, I really started the tripe revolution, actually, you know. If I were to do it again, uh, I'd be Jacques Cousteau. We're live at the airport. <laughs> he has nothing to say because we can't. <laughs> but I also like beef too. I mean, I, I mean, look at the size of me. I eat well. You know? Hamburger Helper was big um, when I was growing up. But my, my mother also also cooked very well as well. And one of the writers, in, with a humorous tone, wrote that we were the farmer's market was the flea market where fruits and nuts sold vegetables. The first thing meal she ever made for my dad was a spam roast. And so I think when he got after the spam roast, he's like, here's a book for you. <laughs> the great reason to live in Berkeley 
is because um, the quality of life is kind of controlled by people who have a great deal of liberal guilt. One of the carpenters was working and he said, you're gonna open a bakery? Berkeley's got bakeries already. Why don't you open a hot dog stand? What we really need is a hot dog stand. <laughs> and, I, and I remember thinking, oh my God, have we screwed up? I remember it, w it worked in two shifts. We would have, not the sex, the drugs. You know, when things got really, really going strong, then they start hitting the tank of nitrous oxide. I don't know, wild free-for-all, um, biggest party of all time. You can go out and get sex for five dollars, and five minutes later it's over. Making love, you take your time. Yeah, see? She agrees already, she said yeah. <laughs> I talk like that, I can't help it. I think Steny Hoyer said it best this morning. So I, when the president submitted his uh, budget request to Congress earlier this year, we just didn't know he did it on tablets instead of paper. <laughs> that ties it all together. Now I just have to say it like Meryl Streep. <laughs> eating a great peach is like a profound experience, a profound eating experience. Oh my God, the combination of, of like tart and sweet and then all of those layers of flavor and the texture, the juice dripping down. Are you getting hungry now?